All right, so switching gears just a little bit here, let's talk about historical ecological context. So um, 20, anywhere from 26 to 13,000 years ago in the Pleistocene period, much of North America was covered by glaciers. And um, you know, this is the age of, of megafauna, mammoths, mastodons, giant bears, and land sloths, et cetera. Um, about 10,000 years ago, the glaciers began to recede. But if you look at this map here, you can see that, that much of the lower Great Plains and the southeastern United States uh, were completely unaffected by glaciation and also far away from glaciers. So uh, this area this area was uh, largely unaffected by the uh, glaciation. And so what that means is that the lower Great Plains and the, and the southeastern United States remained largely intact through the Pleistocene and into the Holocene. And so, um, you know, there was a mass extinction of the megafauna as the glacier receded, smaller animals began to replace the megafauna, uh, but the landscape, uh, at least in the, the lower Great Plains and southeastern US, remained relatively stable. And this was uh, comprised of open forested savannas and prairies due to continuous movement and grazing of ungulate animals and fire. And so historically, you know, the forests of the, of the South would have looked something like this here, with, you know, pine trees, uh, you know, sp sp spread out, not, not densely, um, you know, planted and, um, you know, a, a relatively open prairie underneath. And, uh, you know, native prairie would have looked like this. Tremendous diversity of plants, a lot of flowering plants. Um, so not just grasses, but, but forbs, flowering plants, et cetera. And uh, produced a soil, topsoil that looked like this. Dark, rich, you know, chocolate cake looking, looking soil. And uh, it even produced a soil like that, you know, in the Southeast. Uh, today, where I live in Mississippi, this is what the majority of our topsoil looks like. And so um, what, you're, what we were looking at there was the B horizon. Uh, the dark, rich chocolate cake soil would have been the A or O horizons. Um, but what we see primarily today is the uh, B horizon, which begs, begs the question, where did all the topsoil go? So... Uh, this is the Moro Plots. This is uh, the oldest experimental field um, in America, established in 1876. It's right smack dab in the center of the campus of the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois. And what you see if, if you go there is that the um, ground adjacent to the agricultural experiment area uh, sits about two feet higher than where, the, where it's been um, plant, tilled and planted. And so, um, you know, topsoil was lost secondary to tillage through uh, water erosion, wind erosion, uh, volatilization of carbon into the atmosphere as the, as the organic matter is exposed to air, uh, it volatilizes in the form of CO2. And uh, tillage also reduced or, or results in the destruction of soil microbial life, decreased nutrient density of food, uh, reduced water infiltration and, and desertification in some areas that, that don't get much uh, rainfall. And so, you know, here's water erosion. We've all seen this. Here's wind erosion. That's the Dust Bowl, Texas Panhandle in the 1930s. Uh, this is same phenomenon occurring in 2022. And so soil erosion threatens uh, food production because eroded, eroded and degraded soils cannot support healthy plant growth. So there's a loss of soil organic matter and nutrient loss. About 95% of the soil nitrogen and anywhere from 25 to 50% of the phosphorus is contained in the soil organic matter. And so to offset the nutrient losses inflicted by crop production, large quantities of synthetic fertilizers are required. So and so we've lost a lot of organic matter and that, that aids in cation exchange, enhances plant, plant root growth, root growth and stimulates the increase of important soil microbes. And so this loss of uh, these degraded soils have resulted in the need for genetically modified organisms. So one of the issues, well, so, you know, the issue with, with GMOs is uh, that they can actually transfer genes among species. So 
you know, uh, genetically modified crop will be planted, but it can actually exchange its genes, those genetically modified genes with, uh, you know, native species. Uh, but the bigger problem is that the vast majority of them are Roundup ready, which has resulted in a tremendous amount of glyphosate being sprayed in the U.S. and globally. And so first two crops to be, um, you know, Roundup ready were corn and soybeans. And here you can see the map of where corn and soybeans are grown in the United States in 2021. Uh, this is where corn was planted in 2020 cropland. You see the states of Iowa and Illinois are almost universally in, in corn production. So in addition to, to glyphosate being sprayed everywhere, there's also a loss of plant diversity, which results in a loss of soil microbial diversity. You know, these landscapes look like this. You know, if you're a honeybee or a monarch butterfly, where, where are you going to forage? And so, you know, what are we doing with all of this corn? Well, 44% of it ends up in our gas tanks. A quarter of it is just fed to animals, many of which could be eating, eating grass out on pasture. Uh, only 4% is for human consumption. Similar with soybeans, 74% is being fed to animals. Only 18% is for human consumption. And that's primarily in uh, the form of vegetable oils for, for deep frying foods. And so all this, all this grain is being trucked out and shipped to concentrated animal feeding operations that look like this. Um, and so many people also spray glyphosate on their grain crops uh, as a desiccant right before harvest. So not just Roundup Ready crops, but uh, crops that need to dry down so they can harvest them and get them to the grain elevator for sale. And so as a result, this is the estimated agricultural use of glyphosate in 2011 in the United States. Tremendous, tremendous amount of glyphosate being sprayed. So what is glyphosate? Um, well, it's Roundup. And um, what it does is it inhibits the shikimate pathway in plants and starves them of amino acids and many plant secondary compounds. Uh, things we'll, we'll talk about shortly. Terpenoids, polyketoids, um, these are... Um, plant secondary metabolites. Uh, the shikimate pathway is absent in animal cells, which is why it's perceived to be safe, but it exists in some microorganisms. And it's estimated that somewhere around 50% of the species in our core gut human microbiome are sensitive to glyphosate. And so uh, it was originally in 1964 patented as a chelator, it binds ions. So it binds things that the plants need, you know, potassium, calcium, magnesium, these are all um, these are all ions that it can bind. Uh, 1970s, it was, um, it was patented as a uh, herbicide, which is primarily how it's used. Uh, but more recently in 2010, it was patented as an antimicrobial. It kills organisms, uh, many of which are, are necessary in the soil for uh, healthy plant growth. And many of them, like I mentioned uh, earlier, are, are part of our core human gut microbiome. So this is a list of all the organisms that glyphosate is known to kill that are, that are pathogens. Um, so glyphosate's found in our food. Uh, this is uh, from the Canadian Food Inspection Agency in 2016. Glyphosate was found in 30% of samples tested. And uh, if you look down at the bottom, Children's Food Project, about 30% of infant food and infant cereal uh, had glyphosate in it, which is, you know, as I mentioned earlier, a time of uh, tremendous DNA imprinting and, and uh, gut microbiome uh, assemblage. So um, on the left is a study from the CDC in this country in 2022, 2,300 people aged six and older uh, urine samples, glyphosate was detected in half of the urine samples. And uh, glyphosate's also been reported in, in numerous studies in uh, body fluids, urine, like I just mentioned, breast milk, cord blood. So it's not just glyphosate though, that's being sprayed on our food. Uh, we spray our food with all, all, any number of uh, chemicals, pesticides, insecticides, fungicides. Uh, you can see on the right there, you know, that guy's having to wear a full hazmat suit and respirator while he's, while he's spraying that crop. Uh, strawberries, there's lettuce, same thing. He's wearing a respirator while he's spraying the lettuce. Uh, these are uh, corn seeds that are coated uh, in seed treatments. 
Often these are anti-insecticides and anti-fungicides. So all of this, all of this uh, loss of um, topsoil and um, spraying of glyphosate, chelating the, the uh, ions, uh, spraying other you know, insecticides, fungicides, et cetera, has led to a nutrient decline in our food. And so um, one of the reasons is because bacteria and fungi source nutrients and convert them to bioavailable forms and exchange, uh, in exchange uh, for glucose from the plants. And those bacteria and fungi that are, that are necessary for that process are killed or weakened by tillage and chemical fertilizers, insecticides, et cetera. And then, like I mentioned, the cations are chelated by glyphosate. And so uh, plants uh, similar to us have a microbiome. They have a microbiome in what's called the phylosphere, which is the uh, leaf zone. And they have a, a microbiome in the rhizosphere, the root zone that they assemble. And um, seeds similar to, to human seeds actually have their own microbiome that they that they take with them uh, and that are, that are coated in um, so that when they germinate they have they have the organisms they need around them uh, to begin the process of growth and so uh, plants will will uh, through photosynthesis secrete uh, primarily sugars about 60 percent of the sugar the carbohydrates that a plant produces they they ex uh, exude into the soil to feed the soil microbes. And uh, they can actually uh, use these exudates to influence the structure of the microbial communities in the rhizosphere. And so the plant will select a su different subsets of microbes at different stages of development. Some of these microbes, similar to in our, in our human gut microbiome, uh, can have antimicrobial effects themselves to kill other pathogenic bacteria and fungi around them. And so the plants will secrete blends of compounds and phytochemicals uh, during the during their different growth periods to uh, to cultivate the microbiome that they that they need. Um, what plants also do is uh, they don't just um, absorb soluble ion, ions. They actually um, they will actually absorb entire bacterial cells themselves. They will open the cells up in a phagosome and extract proteins, minerals. Um, lipids, et cetera, out of them. And, uh, and then they'll um, kick them back out to start the process all over again. And, and by doing this, they can be extremely efficient uh, because they don't have to produce a lot of those, those compounds themselves. They can, they can utilize what the bacteria have already produced. And so um, this is a demonstration of, uh, of, um, pine seedlings, you can see the dark brown roots and all of the white small fibrous uh, roots are actually uh, mycorrhizal fungi. So these um, pine seedlings have been, have been colonized by mycorrhizal fungi that dramatically expand their root zone. And as you can see there, they can communicate with each other and, uh, and the mycorrhizal fungi can, can source nutrients uh, that plants that are inaccessible to plants and, and can source them from you know, hundreds of yards away if the mycorrhizal network is intact, but they're obviously destroyed by tillage.